on behalf of the Ukrainian Canadian Congress, uh, it's it's a pleasure to be here to have the invitation to appear before you uh, today. Uh, Alexandra Kichi, our president, spoke with you several weeks ago, and we're here uh, to continue uh, with sharing the views of the Congress. I hope that uh, members of the committee have had a good summer. We've certainly been in touch with many of you and appreciate the work that you've been doing uh, over the summer as well. I also wanted to, uh, since it's September 7th, wish you a happy Ukrainian-Canadian Heritage Day. Uh, it's 130 years that Ukrainian Canadians have uh, been here in Canada, and it's a, a recognized day in several provinces, and we're working to recognize that nationally. So just wanted to note that for the record. Uh, so to today's uh, topics, uh, on June 15th, the UCC had written to Foreign Minister Melanie Jolie expressing our concern about the Canadian government considering waiving of sanctions. On July 6th, we wrote to Prime Minister Trudeau and we stated about this turbine matter that this would be a test of the resolve of the government of Canada to maintain sanctions and to, to continue to isolate Russia. Our feeling was that any waiver of Canadian sanctions would be viewed as capitulation to Russian blackmail and demands and energy terrorism, serving to embolden the Russian terrorist state with far-reaching and negative consequences, not only for Ukraine or the European Union, but for Canadian security as well. Unfortunately, we've seen uh, the Canadian government uh, neither heard nor heeded our concerns, uh, which were shared by the Ukrainian government, and, and the waiver was granted. Uh, we've seen that the Russian government has predictably been very emboldened in demanding further concessions. Uh, despite Canada and Germany's capitulation to the Russian demand, Russia has in fact shut off Nord Stream 1 pipelines entirely, uh, no gas is flowing <laughs> currently, and uh, there's a continuation of um, escalation of, of stories about the, the reasons why the Russian gas supply isn't working this particular week or that particular week. Uh, the Kremlin spokesperson Peskov said on September 5th uh, that Russian gas supplies will not resume until Western sanctions are lifted, using the false pretext that sanctions are preventing the servicing of Russian pipelines. This, of course, is not factual, but that is not the point. The Kremlin lies brazenly and as a matter of regular policy. What does matter is that we've said, as we've said many times, the turbine issue here has never have been about the turbines, it's about sanctions. And now Canada and Germany continue to have a choice whether to continue to uh, play this game with Russian blackmail and demands or whether to simply cancel the sanctions exemption and show Russia that we will not be intimidated in the face of their threats. We understand that the Russian regime responds to strength. The UCC believes it's, it's overdue time for Canada and our allies to show this strength in the face of increasing Russian aggression and pressure. So we call on the committee to do the following. First, to urge the Government of Canada to revoke the permits issued on July 9th, 2022 by the Minister of Foreign Affairs, which allows for the repair and transport of six Siemens Nord Stream 1 turbines over a period of two years to the Russian state gas monopoly Gazprom. Second, to support the designation of the Russian Federation as a state sponsor of terrorism. Third, to support the expulsion of Can from Canada of the Ambassador of the Russian Federation and the Russian diplomatic mission. Fourth, support the suspension of issuing of travel visas by Canada to all citizens of the Russian Federation. Finally, and most importantly, we believe the tide of Russia's genocidal war against Ukraine is being turned on the battlefield by the Ukrainian people's heroic defense of their country. We know that the government of Canada can continue to play a leadership role in ensuring that the Ukrainian people have the equipment, weapons and means with which to finish the fight and ensure the victory of freedom over tyranny. $500 million was allocated in budget 2022 for military and security support to Ukraine. And we know that these funds have been, uh, have been spent and exhausted. So we urge this committee to support us in reviewing the ways that Canada can substantially increase our military assistance to Ukraine going forward. Uh, we look forward to your questions and discussing Canada's support for Ukraine. And I would also note uh, that the committee may wish to consider in the future a, a, a working visit to Ukraine, as we've seen legislatures, uh, legislators from many countries uh, visit Kiev, visit Ukraine to talk to their Ukrainian counterparts and, and get a sense of uh, the matters on the ground. So with that, I'll uh, close my remarks and uh, we're open to questions. Thank you. It's great to see the Ukrainian Canadian Congress back after so long. Um, I have a couple questions about other matters related to Ukraine before we get to turbines. My first question is, to your knowledge, is there a fully operational Canadian embassy uh, in Kyiv right now? 
Sure, I, I, I can uh, answer what we know publicly. Uh, we know that uh, the uh, the Prime Minister and Minister Jolie and Minister Freeland were there uh, in Kiev on May 8th to, uh, to do a ceremony opening the embassy. And we do know that Ambassador Galadza is in Kiev and working, but uh, media coverage that, that we've seen uh, notes that uh, services at the embassy are still suspended due to the security situation and that uh, other people have been directed to other uh, physical locations across Ukraine or Europe for, for visa assistance. So that's what we're aware of. Okay, thank you very much. That's important information. Uh, secondly, uh, Canada has been behind our allies in imposing consequences on Russian diplomats. Uh, are you satisfied with the approach that the government of Canada has taken on this? And why hasn't the government, uh, in your view, why has the government uh, not been more aggressive in this front? I'll let my uh, colleague respond to that one. Um... In our view, I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure why the government hasn't responded to those calls. I mean, we've seen uh, several countries in Europe uh, expel uh, numerous Russian diplomats. Um, we've not seen Canada expel any Russian diplomats since February. Um, uh, added to that, there was a fairly disturbing incident here in Ottawa uh, at the embassy wherein uh, and this was reported publicly, a, uh, what appeared to be a Russian diplomatic car. Uh, people got out of it and, and, and vandalized a, um, uh, it's a, it was a blue and yellow painted bike that was placed outside the embassy on public property that was uh, spray painted and destroyed by uh, what certainly appeared to be people that emerged from a car uh, that was later seen on the property of the Russian uh, embassy. Um, this was in about a month ago. Uh, there has not been uh, any response to this that I have uh, knowledge of. Um, and so, you know, it is our position that the uh, Russian embassy is a, a security threat to Canadians and and that our government should should be forceful in responding to that threat. Thank you. It's fair to say you're disappointed with the lack of response from the government so far? I would say that's fair to say, yes. Okay. Uh, with respect to the turbine issue, we've seen three explanations from the government on this, three different explanations. First, they said it was about German energy security. Uh, that turned out uh, not to be true. Um, then they said it was about calling Putin's bluff. Uh, that, of course, doesn't make any sense in light of uh, new events that the government continues to, to plan to uh, export turbines in spite of the fact that gas has been cut off anyways. But we saw a third explanation from the Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, in a um, in court filings uh, in response to the uh, Ukrainian World Congress. Uh, and in that explanation, the government uh, was, was essentially showing that this decision was about trying to protect jobs in Montreal, uh, speaking about uh, jobs at a Siemens facility uh, that, is, that is in fact relatively close to Minister Jolie's uh, own riding, which raises questions about whether the government was, um, was, was trying to take into consideration constituency politics uh, in granting sanctions waiver. Uh, um, what was your reaction to uh, the information in those filings that the minister was taking into consideration uh, jobs close to home uh, in in the decision to grant this waiver? So the UCC isn't part of the of the court filings process. So uh, this is new information for me as well. Uh, but uh, I mean, as you as you mentioned, we've certainly seen. Uh, a number of uh, attempts to explain uh, this, what we think is a poor decision. Uh, we keep offering our, our, our views on the opportunity to, uh, to correct the situation. Uh, during the German Chancellor's visit, we thought that was a ideal opportunity for both countries to, uh, with Ukrainian support, uh, you know, make, uh, make amends and, and make uh, some clarity in the situation. So. Uh, the, the 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 documents you've reported on have not been reported publicly. I've I've never heard any uh, any situation of uh, Siemens, you know, uh, responding to sort of going out of business if they don't have this this particular contract. They're a large multinational company with with many uh, many processes underway. I'm, I'm sure, uh, but um, I'll let the documents speak for themselves. Obviously, in court, in terms of how the government is responding. Okay, uh, th thank you very much for that. And, and just related to 
questions of uh, of, of Siemens' uh, relationship to the government and uh, th these considerations, uh, we did a search of the lobby registry and found that on April 13th of this year, uh, representatives from Siemens met with um, uh, David Morrison, the Deputy uh, Minister for Foreign Foreign Trade at Global Affairs Canada, uh, and uh, and John Hannaford, another uh, Deputy Minister. Um, do you do you have any uh, indication as to what uh, Siemens was discussing when they were lobbying the government uh, back in April, uh, and how lobbying by Siemens might have uh, played a role in this decision that is that is very much contrary to Ukraine's interest, but might uh, might be in Siemens' own commercial interest. You have 30 seconds, please. Obviously, I, I haven't uh, I haven't seen those documents. I, Siemens has not met with us, and um, uh, I, I, they have a lot of interests uh, in Russia and other places that I'm sure they're trying to understand uh, the government's approach on. You are advocating for Russia to be added uh, to a list of state sponsor uh, terrors. Um, uh, you in in 2017, um, Mr. Zaidinsky, uh, you also um, made testimony um, saying that uh, the same point that Russian Federation should be answered uh, added to the state sponsor um, terror list um, or a state sponsor of terror, I should say. Um, at the end, uh, President Biden decided earlier uh, to recently, I should say, to not designate Russia um, in this way. What do you make of uh, Biden's decision uh, to not to not do that? Um, I would say that uh, that that is a decision that we hope the president will review and retake uh, take another look at. Uh, in the U.S. Congress, there is wide support for this designation. A uh, Senate resolution passed unanimously. Now, I mean, we all know our, our friends down south and the U.S. Senate doesn't pass anything unanimously, but this passed uh, unanimously. This was a resolution introduced by Senator Graham and Senator Blumenthal uh, calling on the administration to, in fact, um, uh, designate Russia a state sponsor of terrorism. We know also that uh, 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 Speaker of the House, uh, Ms. Pelosi, is a strong supporter of this position. She is, of course, from the President's party. Uh, and so we do hope that uh, both uh, the Senate and the House will um, uh, encourage the President to revisit that decision. Your testimony is extremely relevant given the committee's work. During the session, when we heard from ministers Wilkinson and Jolie, I asked a question. What would be the grounds? Because we really did make an effort to make sure that this exemption be revocable. And at that point, I asked what would be the grounds for revoking this exemption? And unfortunately, for time reasons, reasons of time, the Minister uh, Jolie did not have time to answer the question. But I would like to address this question with you. Minister Wilkinson, in an interview on Radio-Canada, said that uh, Russia's game has been made obvious, but he still hopes that the turbine will return to Gazprom and be serviceable or used. The Minister of Foreign Affairs said to CBC News that she did not intend to change her decision despite Gazprom's decision not to allow that first turbine in. Now that this Russian game has been disclosed, what would be the relevance of maintaining this sanction? This exemption. Thank you, Mr. Bergeron. I, I, I have to say I agree with you in, in your question that uh, it is unclear uh, several weeks, months uh, later uh, why, uh, why there would be no revocation of this waiver uh, as the Russian uh, weaponization of energy has become 
emboldened, uh, more dramatic, I would say day by day, uh, despite the, the efforts of the Germans to um, go along with uh, the various conditions and uh, demands and deadlines that were being imposed initially, such as the turbine and, and other matters. So um, I, I agree with you that it is not clear uh, why we would continue to allow this waiver to be extended, uh, which allows two more years of, uh, of Gazprom making profits, which we know ultimately fuel the, the Russian ability to fund the war against Ukraine, a war which we all hope uh, will be wrapped up uh, with a Ukrainian victory in the near future, as opposed to being financed and fueled, uh, literally fueled uh, for, uh, we hope not, years to come. Before the decision was even made by the Canadian government, some were saying that they had doubts as to their relevance of revoking this, these sanctions. Some people believe that the that Russia has reserve turbines, and even Siemens is of the view that the pipeline can work despite these turbines not being online. But these statements from August 21st and 24th from these ministers are previous to Dmitry Peskov's statement from September 5th stating that supply will only resume once sanctions are lifted. So clearly, it's, it's, it's quite obvious that, that this is just pure blackmail on the part of Russia and it would be worthwhile to revoke these, these exemptions specifically given the fact that the scenario of revoking it was raised by the ambassador for Germany when she appeared before this very committee. So I just can't wrap my mind around this. Of course, there have been no new statements from either minister since Mr. Peskov's statement dated September 5th, but I, but I simply can't understand why we would maintain this exemption whereas this Russian blackmail is just been made clearly obvious. If you'll allow me, gentlemen, when you appeared, um, last time you appeared, uh, or the Canadian-Ukrainian Congress appeared, the, the issue of alternatives had been raised, specifically of the Gazprom pipeline on Ukrainian land, which you were stating could have been used to fully replace Nord Stream 1's capacity and that this pipeline could be, was currently used at less than 40% of its current capacity. <clears throat> now that we know that Nord Stream 1 is no longer working, my question is this, supply through this Ukrainian pipeline, has that also been stopped or is there still supply through that Ukrainian pipeline? Um, so just a point of to, to clarify, um, the pipeline that goes through Ukraine is not owned by Gazprom. It's owned by the Ukrainian government and Ukrainian uh, transit system. So that is actually one of the advantages of it is that uh, uh, the ability to manipulate it the way that that uh, as Prom manipulates Nord Stream One is not is not quite as as uh, 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 apparent now. You know Russia can can of course shut gas on and off at the border as it pleases. Uh, but, 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 but if you allow me, at this point, right now, has there been a cut in supply through that pipeline, or is it still ongoing? My understanding, and I, I, you know, I will check on this and get back to you, is that uh, uh, that pipeline is also not delivering gas um, as part of this, uh, um, you know, Peskov's statement stuff. But I, I do have to check on that. I, do, I don't, 
I don't know what the state of it is today. So I, I don't want to say something that's not uh, accurate and I will, I will uh, uh, find that and, and email your office uh, after this. Mr. Bergeron, I just don't understand why at this point uh, the government has, has not been willing to revoke that waiver. Um, you know, at the beginning, when this first came up, when we were first hearing that this was something that the government was considering, I very similarly to, to I think many of the people in this room felt that why on earth would we trust that Putin will do what he said? He's never done what he said. He's clearly weaponizing energy. He's clearly weaponizing food, weaponizing all kinds of those, those things. So why would we put trust in this? Um, now that he's made it very, very clear and his, his government has made it clear that, that they will not be um, they will not be shipping the gas to Germany. I, I cannot get myself around my head around why the government fails to to um, revoke that waiver. So what I what I guess want to ask is, you know, when the ambassador Ambassador Kovlev was here uh, in front of our committee, she talked about this being a dangerous precedent. And I'd love to hear from both of you on on why you think this is a dangerous precedent. What examples you've seen of how this has proven to be a dangerous precedent? You know, here I think you mentioned um, that there the Russians have asked for further concessions. Any any more clarity you can give on that would be very, very welcome. Thank you for uh, for your warm remarks, and I'll pass along our, our best to the UCC's Alberta Provincial Council. They are working incredibly, incredibly hard to uh, support the Ukrainian refugees that have arrived in in that province. So, uh, as you as you said, uh, we believe it's a precedent. We've seen particularly on um, some sectors, for example, tariffs on fertilizer. There has been uh, a lot of uh, impact on the pricing of fertilizer because of the Canadian tariffs. Uh, obviously, uh, the prices, the impacts uh, on the producers, the agricultural producers in Canada. And so we've seen uh, pressure, you know, on the government uh, publicly to um, move on these tariffs, to reduce these tariffs, to, you know, exempt them. Uh, and, and so that's one example, I would say the most public example that we can give you where uh, we've been urging uh, the government to remain strong on this issue, to remain consistent. Uh, we don't think it's helpful. We think it's actually uh, the goal of the Russian Federation to uh, poke holes in both Canadian sanctions policy and in generally Western sanctions policy to, uh, because they, they do understand that the consistency and coordination is critical. So the more that they can, uh, I don't think they particularly care what they poke holes into, but the more that they can poke holes in the sanctions regimes, find differences between jurisdictions and and find in, build in consistencies between our governments uh, that are largely on the same page on this issue. Uh, we believe that is their, their overall goal uh, and part of their, as, as was said, part of their goal of disinformation to say that uh, that the West is kind of inco inconsistent and incoherent uh, in applying this kind of pressure. So, uh, Oris, anything to add to that to that point? No, I think you've you've covered it. Um, and and for you know, knowing that this is an attempt to poke holes in in the sanction regime or the, the cohesiveness with our allies, which of course nobody wants to see, do you think that this waiver continues, has and continues to impact on Canada's credibility around the world? And, and if so, what are the implications of that? Well, I think it's the, it's become the most high profile international uh, issue, uh, which uh, involves, you know, NATO allies, uh, Ukrainian allies, uh, and continues to, uh, you know, propel itself forward now for several months without, without resolution. And it has caused uh, the kind of discussion in Canadian parliaments and other parliaments and in the media, which asks, you know, requires tough, tough questions and tough, tough answers. And as, as has been pointed out, there aren't I can't give you clear answers on why the Canadian government's position is is thus, uh, and you've heard from the German government's representative about their their position as well, which we uh, we certainly have questions about as well. So, I think the the this example can be wrapped up, as you said, with with a review of this waiver, with a, a review of the facts and the situation on the ground, uh, with an undertaking to work with the government of Ukraine as as they had pledged through their ambassador through their government. Uh, in their I previous and initial reaction to the to the suspension, um, we believe there are many better options. There continues to be many better options than the current situation, and um, our 
I would say, surprised by the entrenchment, perhaps, of the positions uh, and uh, and reluctance to listen to to alternatives. Yeah, I was also Thank surprised you. by that, by, by Minister Jolie not um, agreeing to look at that. Um, and certainly, I think this committee should be looking at that as we go forward. First question, allow me to reiterate our support for the people of Ukraine in their valiant fight against an aggressive and hostile invading army. Canada should be doing all that it can to assist the democratic and free Ukrainian people in upholding their sovereignty and their right to live as free people in their own country. In my opinion, this includes maintaining sanctions and all trade with Russia. Now, as recently as August 22nd, Canada's Prime Minister stated, Canada will be there to support Ukraine and Ukrainian people with what they need for as long as it takes. Words in the air, without any substance, after the government's decision in July to grant a two-year exemption to federal sanctions, allowing a Canadian company to return repair turbines from a Russian-German natural gas pip pipeline. A decision Ukraine's president, Vladimir Zelensky, called a manifestation of weakness, with which I agree. No sooner had the Canadian government capitulated than Russia constrained supply of natural gas to Europe. The narrative quickly changed to saying that we called Russia's bluff because we didn't want to be blamed for the shutdown of Russian energy delivery to Europe. Now, Mr. Mikulshishin, is it your opinion there was any bluff to call? Or this is just another narrative pivoting from a government with diminishing relevance in international affairs. Uh, as 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 our president uh, said uh, several weeks ago, as we're saying today, we we don't think that uh, meeting Russian deadlines, which we would call bending to Russian blackmail, uh, to cancel uh, these sanctions uh, and to enact exemptions as per the desire of the Russian Federation. Uh, we don't think that that's a wise move. Um, we we support uh, Canada working as a strong Ukrainian partner, uh, as is Germany, as are many countries uh, which are meeting to decide you know, their future support. But uh, we think that uh, we can't we can't overlook this. This has become a major international uh, matter. It's it is part of uh, the Russian disinformation uh, flow, as has been said, uh, and and you know they continue to find an oil leak a week, basically to uh, find reasons why they're not going to provide more energy to Europe. So uh, we we respectfully call on the government to reconsider. Yeah, thank you. And let's explore energy security and the notion of weaponizing energy that one of my colleagues previously. Wrote referred to. In 2009, Ukraine underwent its own national, pardon me, natural gas supply conflict with Russia. In that sense, Russia showed a clear resolve to weaponize its energy supply to Europe. In spite of this, many European countries ignored the obvious and doubled down on the supply of Russian gas. If Nord Stream 2 had been finalized, fully 80% of Germany's natural gas would have come from Russia. Can you comment on the naivety of European countries doubling down on energy supply? from a hostile provider for the sake of relatively cheap energy versus the obvious outcome of the energy insecurity that was going to ensue? Um, I would say, first of all, Nord Stream 2, it was uh, completed. And as many people said at the time, the, its completion uh, will make a larger Russian invasion of Ukraine far more likely, which is what transpired weeks after the completion of Nord Stream 2. Uh, the full-out invasion was launched. I mean, we've seen, you know, thankfully, uh, uh, the German government has canceled, for now anyway, it's the certification of the pipeline. Uh, I mean, I would say that, uh, you know, through the last decade, or more, there were a lot of voices in Europe and in North America uh, making quite clear to European partners that uh, the, the policy that they were pursuing was not conducive to European security. Uh, I mean, even Nord Stream, Nord Stream 2 was strongly opposed by the American government and who decided to, you know, let Germany pursue this policy despite despite American misgivings. Uh, the result is what we see now. Uh, so, you know, thankfully, thankfully, after the full Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, a lot of European countries are uh, revisiting 
the wisdom of their policy and are changing it. Uh, now, it is uh, no comfort to the Ukrainian people nor to us that that happened after a Russian invasion in which, you know, tens of thousands of people have already been killed and thousands more will be killed. Yeah. What we've noticed is unity in the response to Russians' invasion has been key. Uh, and Putin's goal clearly remains to try to divide NATO and the European Union countries. Um, one of the successes has been the fact that the response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine has been uh, negated, has been has been opposed and strongly opposed uh, uh, by European uh, countries, uh, specifically NATO. Uh, and it's been unified in its response, whether that's uh, giving military aid, whether that's giving aid in general, or whether it's giving uh, support of the United Nations or elsewhere. Um, how important do you see the maintenance of European Union support for Ukraine uh, is as this war unfortunately drags on? Mr. Yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, we, we know, I mean, tomorrow, uh, the uh, I think it's about 40 countries that support Ukraine uh, with defensive uh, weapons are, are meeting to, uh, to review what they can do to support Ukraine. Uh, as I think was mentioned at the previous meeting, it's quite clear that uh, within Europe, uh, there are differences of opinion on this issue. The, the, the EU members that border Russia, uh, the Baltic states, Central and Eastern European states, uh, have a very different view of, and understanding through history and experience of uh, dependency on Russia, and uh, I think have a, a quite different uh, view than, than Germany and, and some of the other countries that have this reliance on, on Russian gas. Um, so I, I think obviously the, the unity of Ukrainian allies is important, which is why uh, the Ukrainian government, I think, took the unprecedented step of, of um, making a statement in this case of, of uh, speaking both to Germany and to Ukraine, sorry, and to Canada as, as allies of, of its uh, war effort, of its humanitarian appeals as well. So uh, we, we definitely uh, believe that this unity must continue, and that's why we think the path back to this uh, unity of purpose and, and unity of, of messaging and actions is to uh, review this decision. And I just want to be clear, uh, currently there's only a permission for the Siemens turbines. There's no other relaxation of sanctions. Uh, and, and regardless, uh, uh, as we've noticed, they're not being used. But if we impose the sanctions back, they still won't be used or they may be used. It, it wouldn't have any significant impact uh, that I see, regardless of one way or the other, uh, other than the, the German people knowing that that Canada didn't do anything to block their energy needs. Uh, uh, I, I just want to be clear that there's no other sanctions that were lifted based on this uh, uh, Siemens turbine exemption to be serviced. Again, as, as far as we know at this point, the 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 exemption is, as, as you know, and as we know, is for these six turbines for two years, which actually was far more broad than the, the initial story was about one particular turbine. So that, that has continued to evolve. And uh, I think with, uh, with the attention of this committee and with the attention of, of uh, the public, uh, we have not seen any other uh, changes on any other sanctions policy. That the Canadian government found itself between a rock and a hard place and that it had to sort of choose between cholera and malaria, if you will, a very difficult decision to take. We found that we believe that the government must have had excellent reasons for making that particular decision at that time. However, in the same breath, we added that it needed to lead to a new round of sanctions and increasing military aid from Canada to Ukraine. But we have not noted increased sanctions since then. And as to military assistance, according to the government site titled Military Support to Ukraine, apart from un the Operation Unified, there has been no announcement for the federal government as to providing military equipment to Ukraine, even though it was extremely important to do this, uh, as the ambassador for Ukraine mentioned over two months ago,
the ambassador really focused on the fact that these supplies needed to reach Ukraine this summer, that that was imperative. How do you view the responses that have been provided to us by Ministers Wilkinson and Julie as to the reasons why they took this difficult decision? And also, how do you view that issue of support, Canadian support, to Ukraine since then? To your mind, does this meet the needs expressed by Ukrainians? Quickly, uh, with regard to your earlier question about the pipeline, the Ukrainian pipeline is working at the same 40% capacity that it was. Uh, with regard to your question about Minister Jolie and Minister Wilkinson's reasoning, we respectfully disagree. With regard to your question about uh, the supply of weapons to Ukraine, we have just written to Minister Anand calling for the government to make another substantial announcement of weapons deliveries following up on uh, the announcement in Budget 2022. So we look forward to a response from the Department of Defense and from the Canadian government on further deliveries of weapons. Thank you. Merci. Mr. Chair, you know, this, this whole conversation is around the sanctions regime, and, and I have found it incredibly difficult to get information about the sanctions, the details of what's been seized, the details of, of, um, of the sanctions, not who's been sanctioned, but, but how much and what. So I'd like to just take a moment, if I could, please bear with me to read into the, into the Hansard um, a request a motion that I brought forward on May 31st 2022 and and it is that that pursuant to standing order 1082 the committee conduct a follow-up study to the 2017 Foreign Affairs Committee study on Canada's sanction regime titled a coherent and effective approach to Canada's sanction regimes Sergei Magnitsky and beyond and that the committee review the government's implementation of the recommendations in the 2017 report that the committee review the need for new recommendations if any resulting from Canada's response to the situation in Ukraine and other situations since 2017 that the committee hold no fewer than four meetings that the committee report its findings to the house and that pursue Pursuant to Standing Order 109, the government table a comprehensive response to the report. Uh, I would like to have an opportunity for the subcommittee to discuss this. I think what we've heard from our witnesses from the UCC is that our sanction regime needs to be um, re-examined very carefully. Uh, we've heard that, that the, the waiver has has fundamentally damaged our sanction regime and has fundamentally damaged the credibility of Canada. So I think it is imperative that this committee undertakes a study at that at the soonest possible moment. Um, I, I, I will end at that point because I know I'm very close to my two minutes. Mr. Um, Oris Denier, I'd like to thank you both. Uh, could you both comment or, or one of you comment on uh, the impact that this turbine decision has had on Canada, Ukraine, relations. Uh, President Zelensky uh, chose to speak uh, personally to this issue. Um, I know from friends and contacts I've spoken to in Ukraine, there's just a lot of, of disappointment, a sense of, of, uh, of betrayal. Um, there's a, a long history of close relations between Canada and Ukraine. Uh, but in this, in this very dark time for Ukraine, uh, what was the significance of this decision for Ukraine? Um, and then maybe related to that, the government talks about standing with our allies, our ally Germany, our ally the U.S. said this is okay. Um, but Ukraine is supposed to be an ally, and yet the government speaks of standing with our allies with no acknowledgement of, of, uh, of the response to this decision from Ukraine. Thank you. Uh, uh, as you, as you've, you've seen the president's statements, you've heard the ambassador's statements, so I, I, I don't need to repeat those. Uh, we believe that the path uh, forward was going to involve uh, more uh, direct cooperation between Canada, Germany, and Ukraine to find a solution that everybody was uh, pleased with and comfortable with. Um, Ukraine counts on Canada as a key ally all, you know, in the last 30 years of building its democracy and particularly now at this moment of, of greatest need with a Russian invasion. So it's, it isn't a, it isn't a great moment. Uh, it isn't a great moment to have allies arguing between each other uh, about this. But we do uh, we do know that the, the Ukrainian people, uh, you know, have uh, have the support of Canada, have the support of the Canadian people, and we look forward to 
moving past this conversation, moving past this specific, specific topic to return to a strong sanctions regime and, and focus on the future where there is more discussion on what Canada can do next. And, uh, to, to Mr. Bergeron's point, uh, there are um, there are some of us who took the position right at the beginning that this was a this was a, a, a terrible decision, and that was that was where we were at as, as a conservative party. But I think there there were others who were maybe a little bit more sympathetic to the government's decision initially, uh, and then uh, since more facts have become clear, um, since since that um, Russia hasn't used uh, Gazprom hasn't taken the first turbine and is seeking further concessions. Um, more, more and more people are coming over to the to the point of view that that surely, uh, even if the decision was justifiable in the first instance, there's no reason to continue the waiver now. Uh, have you had ongoing engagement with the government? Um, I mean, even in the last couple of days since the most recent announcements from the Kremlin, uh, what is the government saying now? Are they saying the same things? Are they saying different things compared to what they were saying at the beginning of this? Um, I mean, I'll quickly just answer. We've, we've, uh, about a, a week or more ago, we, we wrote again to Minister Jolie making the point that, you know, now is the time to, to cancel this waiver. Uh, we have, not, <clears throat> excuse me, we have not yet heard back from the office of the Minister of Foreign Affairs and we will follow up. And should we hear something, we will, of course, be happy to share that. Okay, thank you. And I, I'm assuming you would welcome the opportunity for, for further engagement with the minister. I know we would we would welcome the opportunity to have her back as some of these new revelations have, have come out. Um, are, are you seeking opportunities just for further engagement with the minister to get clarity on on uh, what the government's position is now in light of the new new information? Yes, definitely. We, uh, we continue to reach out to her office uh, and uh, we look for public statements and, and uh, have, have been open to hearing any developments from their perspective. Yeah. Um, further following up on Mr. Zubari's comments, um, one of the principal arguments for sending this turbine... I'm afraid oh, you're... Okay. You know, we, we are having, um, you know, th this, uh, this discussion with you today and, and um, you mentioned in your opening statement that you encouraged our committee to travel to Ukraine. Um, I'm sure, as you know, um, we had uh, travel plans uh, that were vetoed um, in the House of Commons by the Conservative Party. Are you aware, um, gentlemen, of, of why uh, that travel was, was vetoed? Uh, no, we're not uh, privy to the discussions of the committee in terms of travel, but uh, we've certainly encouraged our parliamentarians uh, and, and the government officials to travel to Ukraine at the safest and earliest opportunity. Thank you. I also know that in your introduction, you encouraged uh, Canada to continue um, supporting Ukraine militarily. Um, and, uh, you know, my understanding is that one of the things Ukraine needs most right now are armored vehicles. Um, and, uh, and, and we know how crucial armored vehicles are to the operation that is ongoing actually at the moment um, uh, in, in the hopes that Ukraine will be able to retake some of its territory. Um, Canada has already sent uh, some ar armored vehicles to Ukraine, um, and I, I do note that one a country that has large stocks of these vehicles but seems to be unwilling to send them to Ukraine is Germany. Um, do, you, do you have any information about Germany's you know, refusal uh, to provide these, and, and how can we make sure um, to get more armored vehicles to Ukraine quickly? Um. Germany is providing uh, weapons to Ukraine. Uh, it is providing them at a pace that is uh, not uh, the pace we would like to see. And, and, you know, any of your engagements with your German counterparts in the Bundestag, that would get them to put uh, pressure on the German government to speed up these deliveries would be most welcome by us. Very good. Thank you. And Given that we are about to enter um, you know, winter, uh, and, and certainly we're hearing a lot about the challenging winter ahead for Europe, but I believe the winter will be also challenging for Ukraine, um, given uh, you know how uh, snow and, and cold might affect your military operations. Um, how do you see uh, the coming months um, in, in Ukraine on the ground, and how can we make sure that you, you have the best possible tools over the course of the coming months? 
I think from an immediate uh, civilian survival perspective, I know we have, through our humanitarian appeal, begun to talk about winterization. Uh, and we know that there are substantial funds that the government of Canada has yet to expend, uh, I believe about $75 million that could be spent on winterization, which means everything from providing uh, heating, uh, basic repairs for people, you know, uh, all of these these devastated villages that we've seen on, on, on our screens uh, where roofs and doors and windows are gone and people are uh, left cooking over, you know, basically campfire or stoves. So civilian, mil uh, civilian winterization is essential to enable people to survive. And as we said, the next steps on military and security support together with our allies, identifying uh, does Canada have more light armored vehicles or more missiles or more uh, communication systems that would be uh, effective for the Ukrainian army to continue its offensive uh, so that the war is, uh, it's an honor to be um, here today. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity to talk to you. Uh, my comments are aimed at shedding light on what I see as a central question uh, when it comes to the debate about the gas turbines. Um, should Canada revoke the permit allowing the maintenance of the now infamous uh, gas turbines? The answer to this question is a resounding yes. Doing otherwise, that is, continuing with the sanctions exemption, does not advance Canada's interests, does not help our allies, our European allies, with their energy problems, and continues to provide the Russian dictator Vladimir Putin with the opportunities for blackmail and leverage against the West. Let me briefly elaborate in the, in the five minutes that I have. It is clear to all that the technical issues have nothing to do with Russia's decision, first to reduce and then completely shut down gas flows to Europe via Nord Stream 1. Russia's actions over the years, and particularly in the last few months, made this very clear. There is no need to go over that familiar terrain that has been covered in the deliberations of this committee again. It's a political decision aimed at blackmailing and forcing Europe to cease or to ease or break sanctions imposed on Russia as a result of its brutal and unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. Kremlin spokesperson Peskov said as much and with great clarity uh, on Monday, and I would add Putin repeated the same thing uh, today in his remarks. It is also a fact that this, clearly this, this fact is clearly recognized by German and other European publics as polling consistently indicates. It will be giving too little credit to European public's political sophistication to argue that they will buy into Russian excuses and blame Canada uh, for the difficulties. Therefore, it is clear that Canada's decision to continue to provide an exemption for the gas turbines will have no role in determining whether Russia will resume gas flows to Europe or not. Nor will revoking the permit lead to a backlash against Canada from the Europeans. What it does, however, is to provide an ongoing point of leverage for the Kremlin to create friction and discord between allies and enabling the Kremlin to develop a narrative of Western weakness and disunity by pointing out the carve-outs within the sanctions regime. In other words, Kremlin turns to other countries and says, look, Canada, Germany, and other Western powers immediately violate their own sanctions regime and carve out exemptions when their domestic interests are threatened. Why would you go along with this and pay the price while they are not interested in doing the same? And Putin is basically repeating the same uh, line today in his, in his talk. Continuing with the exemption also does not help our European allies with their energy needs. What would help is to get Canadian LNG to them as they have been asking for publicly and very clearly. Not only has Chancellor Scholz voiced his desire uh, for more Canadian LNG, but also other allies, such as Poland and Latvia, have been calling for more Canadian gas to Europe for a while. Clearing the obstacles in front of, the, of this real and tangible support for Canada's allies is what is urgently needed. That is what a good ally would do. Lastly, it is important to keep in mind the broader geopolitical context in which this issue needs to be considered. The strategic goal for Canada must be Ukrainian victory in this war. Supporting Ukraine is not charity, but enlightened self-interest. What is at stake for Canada is not only the security and prosperity of our European allies, but also the future of rules-based international order that has benefited Canada and Canadians immensely.
The country, Russia, that launched this brutal attack on that international order is not far to the east of us, but an immediate neighbor to the north in the Arctic. Policies that provide leverage and opportunity for Russia are not in the interest of Canada. To recapitulate, whatever the initial merits of the decision to provide an exemption, there are no strategic, political, or economic reasons now to continue to provide Russia with potential leverage for the next two years. It neither advances Canada's interests nor elevates our allies' suffering. The permit should be revoked, and Canada should look for ways to get its LNG to European markets as far as it can. Thank you very much for this opportunity to talk to you today. Um, over the past months, Russia has threatened to starve vulnerable nations around the world by blockading millions of tons of Ukrainian grain while shelling and bombing critical Ukrainian agricultural infrastructure to induce a global grain shortage. At the same time, Russia has falsely blamed Western and Canadian sanctions for causing this food crisis, despite the fact that our sanctions do not affect any Ukrainian agricultural infrastructure or the transport of grain and food to those nations that rely on it. Russia's weaponization of hunger is matched in cruelty by its use of energy to freeze Russia's neighbors. Many Europeans experienced this firsthand when Russia cut all gas supplies transiting Ukraine in January of 2009. Canadians only recently became aware of Putin's energy warfare after Global Affairs granted Gazprom a sanctions exemption to permit the repair in Canada of turbines that compress gas exported from Russia through the Nord Stream pipeline to Europe. However, the Kremlin's use of energy as a point of geopolitical leverage did not emerge out of a vacuum. The former vice president of Gazprom Bank, Igor Volubyev, told a Polish newspaper in May how he was instructed by Gazprom executives to develop anti-Ukrainian narratives already in 2005 when Ukraine's political trajectory shifted towards Europe. He also created anti-Georgian narratives in 2008 when Russia invaded South Ossetia and Abkhazia. According to Volubyev, all decisions within Gazprom are made inside the Russian presidential administration. If Canada's decision to grant, to grant Gazprom a sanctions waiver was intended to call Putin's bluff, that mission has been accomplished. It is now clear that our sanctions did not impair Gazprom's ability to pump gas through the Nord Stream pipeline. As we've heard from previous witnesses today, they never were. Underscoring the false nature of Russia's accusations was a recent report published by the BBC, which exposed massive gas flares at Gazprom's Portovaya compression station near the Russian starting point of the Nord Stream pipeline. Flaring is a process by which gas producers burn off large quantities of gas for sustained periods of time. According to that report, $10 million of gas are being burned off by Gazprom each day. Gas which would otherwise be pumped through Nord Stream to Germany and Europe or through existing pipelines that transit Ukraine and Poland. Indeed, as other witnesses have pointed out, the Kremlin has now explicitly stated that gas will only start flowing through Nord Stream once Canadian and Western sanctions have been lifted. This is blackmail. Vladimir Putin's intent is to weaponize gas in order to erode Western support for Ukraine and undermine Canadian and allied democracies by blaming us for rising inflation and energy costs through disinformation. This is happening right now. This morning, in fact, in Vladivostok, Vladimir Putin doubled down on his accusations about Western sanctions and even claimed, quote, we did not start anything in terms of military actions. We are trying to end it. Putin made it very clear as well at the same time that polarization of the democratic world uh, that his regime is actively contributing to will greatly benefit Russia. We're currently witnessing Russian state media and pro-authoritarian groups promote these exact narratives. Protests that were organized by Kremlin-aligned communists and populist neo-fascists in Europe this past weekend will be exploited by Russian propagandists to build on them and destabilize Western democracies. We cannot rule out that these false narratives will not inspire similar protests among Canadian far-right and far-left extremist groups. In Putin's own words, the sole beneficiary of this polarization is his regime. Now that Putin's bluff is being called, the sanctions waiver issued by Global Affairs should be revoked and the integrity of Canada's sanctions regime should be restored. Sanctions work when they are applied, sustained and enforced. Finally, Canada should prioritize the development of infrastructure to export Canadian gas to Europe, as many of our allies have asked us to do. Canadian small nuclear reactor technology can also help take our help our allies take control of their own supply of electricity. In fact, Estonia recently signed an agreement just to do that. Canada 
can provide a mutually beneficial contribution to European energy security that will lead to greater overall European stability if we only commit to it. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I look forward to your questions. Je m'appelle Dr. Bonjour. I'm Dr. Benjamin L. Schmidt. I am an astrophysics research associate in Harvard. Uh, I'm a former European Energy Security Advisor from the U.S. Department of State, and currently I'm a research associate at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics and Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute, senior fellow at the Center for European Policy Analysis, and a Rethinking Diplomacy fellow at Duke University. We meet today nearly seven months since Moscow unleashed its horrific campaign of chaos in Ukraine, but let's be clear, just as Putin's military aggression against Ukraine didn't start with its February large-scale invasion, the Kremlin's wider hybrid aggression against global democracies, including weaponized energy, is nothing new as well. So with this in mind, we can look back on three critical lessons. First, energy and critical infrastructure proposals advanced by Putin's authoritarian regime are not just commercial deals. Nord Stream n'est pas seulement un accord commercial. It is not solely a commercial agreement. ...tool to slow and stop Kremlin malign energy activities over the years. And third, that technology export controls remain vital to throttle the Kremlin's ability to acquire systems and components needed to both wage and fund its horrific war. Given total state control in authoritarian nations like Russia, nearly every sector of society can be weaponized to advance geopolitical aims, from cyberspace to supply chains to space assets and, of course, energy for political blackmail. So knowing this, undermining sanctions unity on the Nord Stream 1 turbines simply to quote-unquote call Putin's bluff is only justifiable in a world where Russia hasn't been weaponizing energy for years. But it has. For context, we can look at Putin's Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Nord Stream 2 was a long-running geostrategic anchor that Germany clung to openly as Russia created a gas crisis last year. In 2021, the Kremlin intentionally limited natural gas volumes destined for European storages, most of which were owned by Gazprom. Despite this reality, Berlin convinced the United States government to waive its own mandatory bipartisan sanctions aimed at stopping Nord Stream 2 with Berlin agreeing to seek EU sanctions in the case that Russia took further steps to weaponize its energy resources. Even though Putin did just that, Berlin failed to seek those sanctions, emboldening Putin's confidence that energy pressure could limit the latitude of foreign policy responses to Russia's horrific war against Ukraine. Thankfully, Washington finally sanctioned Nord Stream 2 AG and its corporate officers just hours before Putin's large-scale invasion began, ending the project hopefully for good. But distressingly, even with this fresh lesson in mind, history seems to be repeating itself here in Canada. For months, Gazprom has uh, cut flows to at least a dozen EU member states, including via its Nord Stream 1 pipeline, since mid-June cut by 60, 80, and now 100%. Multiple technical assessments from German ministries and officials stated that Russia's explanation for these cuts, supposed technical issues, quote-unquote, that could only be solved, quote-unquote, by receiving stranded Siemens turbines near Montreal were nothing more than pretext for another political energy cut. That's why it's so baffling that Berlin simultaneously pressured Ottawa to undermine its own technology sanctions against Russia, even if Gazprom's dubious technical justifications had merit, and they do not have merit. The Kremlin could easily restore gas deliveries to Europe right now via other routes where it's limiting flows. That it refuses to do so speaks volumes about Putin's uh, malign intent. Berlin pressuring Ottawa to undermine sanctions unity through the turbine waiver sets a worrying precedent from which the Kremlin will learn a troubling lesson. One, that weaponizing energy dependence can be effective at breaking Western consensus on the very technology export controls that are curbing Russia's military potential and economic engine. Russia's refusal this summer to take custody of the first of the turbines transferred to Germany raises questions about Ottawa's subsequent decision to stand by its waiver after the visit of German Chancellor Schultz in late August when news reports say that it authorized the transfer of five additional Siemens turbines. To cap off the saga, this week Kremlin spokesman Peskov stated out loud what the world knew for months. The turbine story was a cover for energy weaponization, declaring that the cuts will continue until sanctions are dropped and that, quote, other reasons that would cause cause problems with the pumping simply don't exist. So in closing, I'll leave you with three very brief recommendations. Number one, Canada should reverse the turbine sanctions waiver as soon as possible, backed by political endorsements from Germany and the United States. Two, 
Canada should expand sanctions on the Putin regime and increasing, uh, increase LNG export capacity, incentivizing exports to European partners and allies. And three, Canada should pass legislation to curb Kremlin strategic corruption in Western democracies, just like that which I proposed to U.S. Congress called the Stop Helping America's Malign Enemies or Shame Act. In our dire struggle against Russia's criminal onslaught against Ukraine, Putin and his authoritarian cronies need to see a wall of strength from democracies unwilling to waver in their resolve to hold the Kremlin to account. Then there will be only one nation forced to change its foreign policy uh, in order to avoid, quote-unquote, Ukraine fatigue, uh, and that would be Putin's Russia. Thank you for your attention. I look forward to your questions today. If you invited the Foreign Affairs Minister of Ukraine to appear in front of this committee? And if so, what was the response? Uh, Mr. Mr. Chong, uh, I can assure you that I've been advised by the clerk that the foreign minister of Ukraine was invited, an invitation was extended, uh, but regrettably, um, uh, he was not available. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to direct my question to uh, Dr. Schmidt. Uh, According to the Finnish Center for Research on Energy and Clean Air, Russia has raked in 158 billion euros since the war began in Ukraine for the sale of oil and gas exports, more than half of which has been to the European Union. In fact, this Finnish research center has indicated in its report that 43 billion euros uh, have been added to the Russian budget uh, from the sale of these exports to uh, the European Union. Uh, Canada could displace uh, Russian gas in Western Europe. Uh, we are the fifth largest natural gas producer in the world. We have the longest coastline in the world. And on my back of the napkin calculation, a simple 15% increase in Canadian natural gas production could displace more than a third of all Russian gas in Western Europe. Recently, Chancellor Schultz was here in Canada and he said, quote, Germany is moving away from Russian energy at warp speed. Canada is our partner of choice, end quote. He further added comment, quote, for now, this means increasing our LNG imports. We hope that Canada we hope that Canadian LNG will play a major role in this, end quote. Uh, the Canadian Prime Minister rejected uh, the German request uh, to work with Germany to export more Canadian LNG to Europe. I'd like your comments on that. Well, I think that Canada can play a major role here. Obviously, increasing the uh, amount of export infrastructure on Canadian uh, the, uh, on Canada's Atlantic coast is incredibly important, as well as using the St. Lawrence Seaway to the greatest extent possible, uh, potentially to bring LNG through the Great Lakes. Um, again, I, uh, I, I defer to Canadian experts on the various routes, but it can be done. Now, with that in mind, we also have to look at the extent that uh, Canada and other Western allies can help the EU um, take a wartime level of effort to build out the energy import infrastructure as quickly as possible to increase the bandwidth of LNG that can be brought in to displace uh, Russian natural gas. Of course, we want to move to renewables as quickly as possible. Of course, we need to address the climate crisis. But in a wartime contingency, we need a one-for-one -one swap with um, with these, uh, these, these volumes. Well, on that last point, Dr. Schmidt, you know, the, the current government has indicated it takes five to 10 years to build an LNG facility here in Canada, but Germany is about to construct two new LNG terminals in the Baltic Sea in about 12 months. Germany's not a major energy producer, yet they're able to construct these two new terminals in the Baltic Sea in just over 12 months. That's what the German economic minister has recently said. They announced the construction of these two new terminals just shortly after the war began on February 24th. And yet we as an energy producer, the fifth largest natural gas producer in the world with an immense capability to engineer, to design and to build energy infrastructure has a government that says it's gonna take five to 10 years to construct. You know, I just, I wanna uh, finish on this point and allow you to comment on it. The Prime Minister said during Chancellor Schultz's visit that, quote, there never has been a strong business case, end quote, for LNG facilities on the East Coast. 
And yet Tim, Timothy Egan, who's president of the Canadian Gas Association, essentially said the Prime Minister is wrong. He said the biggest obstacle is not that there isn't a business case, but regulatory uncertainty from the federal government. He said, quote, there's an incredible business case if the regulatory framework is clear. All the environmental approval processes, are the environmental approval processes going to be fast enough and clear enough? How is it that this can happen so quickly in the United States and it can't happen as quickly in Canada, end quote? So I'd like your comment on our inability to be a willing partner in the NATO alliance to step up to the plate to export natural gas to Europe to displace Russian gas, which is funding Putin's war machine. I, I think that Canada needs to, just like a lot of the G7 members that are producers, including the United States and others, um, to make sure that global democracies are making our, our energy resources available to Europe as quickly as possible. But I do want to point out on the German side, you know, they're doing a number of things. Number one, you have two floating storage and regasification units uh, in Brunsbüttel and Wilhelmshaven, Germany, that are being built. But there also is a need to build out um, floating storage and regasification units or floating LNG import terminals at locations that are strategic and have existing infrastructure. And there's been, you know, some churn in the media about potential, um, you know, uh, 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 companies that are thinking about this at Lubmin, Germany. But Lubmin, Germany is the point of contact uh, where Nord Stream 2 comes on shore. And in June, the econ ministry in Berlin came out and said that they were considering the following plan, which was to expropriate the Nord Stream 2 pipelines in German waters, physically cut and sever them away from the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, which is currently unused due to US sanctions, and to attach them to floating storage and gasification units to bring non-Russian LNG through those systems and through the Lubmin gas hub and the Oigal pipeline onshore, basically, again, having a wartime level of effort and, um, and speed to leverage existing infrastructure. That still hasn't happened yet. We need more signals from, from Berlin that that's going to happen. But look, that's got to happen infrastructure-wise on both sides of the Atlantic, and we need to do it awful quick. I have no further questions, Mr. Chair. Um, my first question is for Mr. Kolga. You have previously spoken to the opportunities for trade and stronger relations between Canada and the Baltic states. Uh, and I was hoping you could speak to the importance of building these ties in the context of Russia's aggression in the region and on why it's key uh, for Canada to expand its diplomatic as well as military presence in the region. Well, thank you very much for that question, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, there certainly is a demand in the Baltic states, and there has been quite some time for uh, the export of, of Canadian energy. Uh, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, uh, Canada, Canada and Estonia have just recently signed an agreement uh, to develop a, a program to build uh, small-scale nuclear reactors in Estonia to wean that country uh, off of uh, Russian uh, electrical supplies. Uh, Lithuania, uh, just about three years ago, four years ago, built an offshore LNG terminal, and uh, officials in all three Baltic states have clearly stated that they would welcome uh, Canadian gas uh, in, those, uh, in those countries. Um, there are opportunities for Canada to begin exporting gas quickly. Uh, the, in the previous uh, question, there was a, a question about the timelines to build some of this infrastructure. Um, the United States, in the United States, there is technology available right now uh, to build offshore export LNG terminals uh, off the coast of Canada. Th these could be built uh, within uh, within 12 months, and we could start exporting uh, LNG gas to uh, to the Baltic states and uh, and other European countries uh, quite quickly. Um, other trade opportunities are, of course, in, in the IT sector. Estonia is a leader in uh, developing uh, e-government technologies and such. Um, they've recently set up shop here in Canada, and I think that Canada could, uh, could greatly benefit uh, from working with Estonia to develop our own, uh, our own uh, technologies here. So there are uh, plenty of opportunities, and the fact that Canada has established and has announced it will establish uh, uh, full embassies in all three Baltic states is, is certainly a positive sign. Thank you for those insights, Mr. Kolga. Uh, Mr. Chair, through you, uh, Dr. Devlin, my question is for you next. Um, you have written about the threat posed by President Lukashenko and his gray zone aggression against NATO and the EU. 
Um, are you able to speak uh, to his role in the current conflict and how you see Belarus, uh, Belarus's role evolving as this conflict continues? Uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for this uh, question. Um, effectively speaking, Belarus is, is, is a de facto colony of Russia right now under, uh, under Lukashenko's rule. It has been, it continues to be a staging ground for Russian forces at the first phase of the war. Uh, they uh, did uh, invade uh, from uh, from Belarus as well. Continue to carry out uh, military strikes uh, from Belarus. The Russian planes and air force continue to attack uh, Ukraine uh, through uh, Belarus and uh, Belarusian uh, ammunition uh, depots, missiles and and, and artillery shells, etc., are are being basically transported and used uh, by Russia in in this war. Um, perhaps there's the only silver lining uh, is is that. Um, partly because of the resistance, because of the, of the Belarusian people, um, uh, Lukashenko could not um, enter the war in full force uh, on the side of Russia, uh, knowing that there is huge resistance, a significant resistance uh, to such a, a clear, open uh, intervention. But that does not necessarily mean that it will not happen uh, in the future, particularly if um, uh, if, if Ukrainian offensive, uh, counteroffensive in the south goes well, uh, Russia might end up um, using the available uh, you know, strategic um, resources, particularly long-range uh, 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 missiles and, and others uh, in Belarus to, to threaten and attack uh, Kiev more, uh, not necessarily with ground troops, but uh, but uh, with missiles and, and, and artillery shells and, and air force uh, that might, uh, you know, bring in uh, in Belarus into into fight uh, uh, more. But we have to um, treat and, and assume uh, that uh, Belarus under uh, under Lukashenko uh, continue to pose uh, a threat uh, to European uh, peace and stability. And this will be a long war. Um, the, I think one of the biggest um, uh, threats today is to uh, uh, resist the attempts by Russia, try to freeze the uh, existing uh, status quo when and if um, uh, Ukrainian country offensive is successful and Russia uh, tries to freeze the current uh, battle lines instead of um, uh, withdrawing. So I, I see that that's big, it's one of the biggest uh, threats in the next uh, three to six months. And I'll just say one line saying that the uh, one of the biggest threats outside of Ukraine, outside of the conflict directly, is losing Western support, which we absolutely can't do to um, to make sure that uh, Western support is maintained so that Ukraine um, is supported uh, with all of the weapons and, and all of the sanctions that are needed to make sure that the Putin regime cannot succeed in Ukraine. And so as we're going into this energy crisis that's been a crisis for, you know, almost two years now. Um, we absolutely need to make sure that uh, Putin cannot weaponize energy in order to diminish Western resolve to defeat the Russian Federation and, uh, and make sure that Ukraine is victorious. Thank you for the clarity of your comments. Mr. Schmidt, I must say that I thought it was refreshing to hear a few words in uh, the language of Moliere or in French from uh, a colleague from the other side of the border. Thank you very much. My question is for Mr. Koga. In so far as the other witnesses want to say anything to that, then they're welcome. Two former generals from the U.S., David Petra Pet Petraeus and Wesley Clark, looked at the decision made by the government of Canada um, and they said that there was the issue of a consensus among allies, whereas the former chief of the defense staff in Canada, Rick Hillier, seemed to say that it would mean um, lightened sanctions for R Russia. Did we not actually end up with the worst of both scenarios another way? In other words, we have undermined cohesion among allies while opening the door to a weakened sanctions regime with Russia. Uh, thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. Yes, I, I completely agree that uh, we, we have arrived at the worst of both worlds. Um, we've arrived at a, at a lose-lose situation. Um, the the fact that we have compromised on uh, on these sanctions opens the door to uh, other allies uh, doing the same. They can justify that action by pointing to to uh, uh, 
uh, our um, uh, decision to to provide that exemption to to Gazprom uh, that is problematic. I think that publicly our NATO allies uh, are going to be, of course, supportive of of any decision that we've taken. We've uh, we spoke with the we worked with the Germans on this on this issue, but uh, uh, I know that uh, privately, um, certainly amongst our our uh, Eastern European NATO allies in the Baltic states, Poland and beyond, um, I think that uh, our decision did raise eyebrows. And I know that uh, that decision also raised eyebrows amongst uh, Russian opposition leaders as well. Um, they all understand that uh, what Putin is, is very much hoping for is a return to business as usual. Um, the erosion of sanctions, as he clearly mentioned today in Vladivostok, is his, uh, one of his primary goals at the moment. Um, and so I think that Canada still has an opportunity to correct that decision uh, by cancelling uh, that permit to Gazprom and uh, and uh, rebuilding confidence in, in our sanctions regime. I think that's 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 vital today, uh, certainly to maintain that cohesion amongst our allies, but also to maintain trust in in our own uh, defence policy, foreign policy, and our and our sanctions policy. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. A question for Mr. Schmidt. Germany has apparently already reached 75% of uh, stocks of, of gas uh, for the winter. You said on Twilter that uh, this could counter the use of a weaponization of energy by Russia. Uh, do you have some concerns given the decision announced by Mr. Peskov, to the effect that there would be a definite cutting off of supply until the sanctions were lifted, do you have some concerns that we may not be able to, that they may not be able to continue to store this uh, energy? Well, that's an incredibly, uh, uh, you know, prescient question, you know, and that's something we're going to have to monitor over the next uh, several weeks and months. The bottom line is, it's one thing to have storage. You absolutely need to have this storage uh, built up uh, as high as possible before the winter. But there's also has to be latent um, LNG imports uh, or or natural gas flows uh, that are backing that up throughout the winter. So you have to have, you know, it, it's it's not just a you know uh, fill it up to a hundred percent and then you're good for the the winter. You really need to have. Um, additional flows uh, going on of, of that resource. Um, so that means, you know, if you can't increase the flows very much because Russia is actively cutting off gas flows, you know, you also have to do a lot for energy efficiency. And that's exactly what the German government and German people are doing right now. Um, and that's going to have to continue. It's going to have to continue across Europe. But you know, partners and allies need to supply as, as much energy resource to Europe, especially in the next few months as possible, to make sure that uh, they get through the winter. Several experts are refuting the idea that the Siemens turbines are absolutely necessary for Nord Stream 1 to operate. Other models could have worked. And Russia seemingly has others in a reserve. In your view, is this a credible assessment? No, it's not. The bottom line is we have to have policies that are based on science and technology that undergird uh, our, our decision making. So simply to you know set up this scenario where we're pushing back on disinformation to call someone's bluff, the, the, the fact of the matter is that the German government several times pointed out that this was not uh, backed up by technical reality, the Bundesnetzagentur, the Wirtschafts, uh, Wirtschaftsministerium, et cetera, et cetera. Siemens just this week said about this uh, purported oil leak uh, that such leaks do not normally affect the operation of a turbine and can be sealed on site. It's a routine procedure within the scope of maintenance work. In the past, the occurrence of this type of leak has not led to a shutdown of operations. Bottom line is we need to turn back these waivers to restore sanctions unity because Putin will enact as much as possible energy weaponization to open up where he's really being hurt right now, which is technology calibrated sanctions that are undermining his ability to get 
uh, systems that can can drive his economy, energy technologies, and things of this nature, and also weapons, uh, you know, dual use weapons technologies, things like semiconductors. There's been any number of reports of Ukrainian military personnel opening up captured uh, Russian military equipment, and lo and behold, inside are commercial semiconductor products that are stripped out of uh, products like washing machines and dishwashers and things like this. That means our technology sanctions are working. That's why we can't allow energy weaponization to push back on this uh, this technology calibrated uh, technology sanctions uh, approach, and that's why our foreign policy collectively as global democracies have to be driven by technical reality. Kolga, you were one of the witnesses, one of the key witnesses for the 2017 study, but we also had another witness that testified for this committee. Um, Vladimir Kara Mirza was one of the witnesses. He was arrested from, uh, he was arrested in Russia in April, um, and he's facing 10 years, and today is his birthday. So I just wanted to take a moment to, uh, to acknowledge that he has testified for this committee and, and is in a very, very difficult place looking at 10 years um, in prison for criticizing the war in Ukraine. Uh, so I am I'm sorry, Mr. Kolga, and those that, that know um, Mr. Kara Mirza. Um, to start with, I would actually like to start actually with you, Mr. With Mr. Kur Kolga. You know, you were a key witness in 2017. You have talked about how these, this waiver, this particular waiver has harmed our sanctions regime. Um, you know, there were recommendations that came out of, our out of the study of the sanctions regime in 2017 that have not been acted upon. Can you talk a little bit about how we could strengthen our sanctions regime, how we should be making it more transparent, uh, more accountable, easier to, to understand for Canadians? Well, thank you very much for that uh, question. Yeah, there's. I think there's a lot that uh, that Canada could be doing to um, to make our own sanctions regime more effective. Uh, you know, first and foremost is working with our allies to um, to harmonize our uh, our policies and our legislation with the, the United States, EU, and 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 the UK. Um, we should be stepping up enforcement of our sanctions policy. Um, to date, uh, we've since the start of the war, we've our, uh, the RCMP has seized $122.3 million worth of, of Russian assets. Uh, we know for a fact that Russian oligarchs have uh, billions of dollars of assets uh, hidden well in plain sight in this country. Uh, we need to do, be doing a heck of a lot more if, if we intend to have a, use our sanctions policy as a, as a consequence and a cost for, for these foreign regimes, then we need to make sure that we're, we're using those, that, uh, that legislation properly. Um, you know, during the, uh, the past six months, the Canadian government has, has actually enacted new legislation, an amendment to the Special Economic Measures Act that would also allow our government to repurpose some of those assets that have been frozen. We need to start using that, that legislation. We need to start repurposing some of those billions of dollars that uh, are hidden in this country. Um, and certainly we could use some of those, those funds to help uh, support Ukraine in its struggle to uh, push Russia back past the the uh, February 24th uh, border and to to reclaim Crimea and certainly to rebuild uh, that country. Um, mm -hmm. What we could also be doing is is introducing a measure of of transparency to that entire process. How those sa sanctions are imposed, who they're being imposed on, what sort of assets these uh, targeted individuals have, and and certainly some accountability through regular reporting. And and I would also suggest that the um, this committee uh, should be given the power to uh, to nominate candidates uh, for our sanctions list. Um, you are experts in Parliament. Um, you you've heard from experts. You know who these uh, human rights abusers are. Those who uh, threaten the stability of of Western democracies and in their own countries. You know who these people are. And so, giving this committee committee uh, some more power to. Uh, to designate uh, uh, individuals and entities for our sanctions list is, is also important. Uh, but I would also say that one of the most important things that, that you could do is to have that review of our sanctions legislation as you've proposed. And I would, com I and I think uh, a lot of other human rights activists in Canada and elsewhere would, would very much support this, as I'm sure Vladimir Karamurza would. 
Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, and, and you talk about transparency and accountability. And, you know, I've, I've asked multiple times in the House of Commons, I've, I've put order paper questions through access to information, um, and I cannot get the answers I need. In fact, I've been told that because they can't give a, a, a a pure or 100% accurate answer, they won't give me an answer at all. Um, in fact, we've asked to have representatives from CBSA and RCMP attend this committee so we could get a better understanding of that. So I, I fully um, I fully agree with you when you talk about the need for us to do that. Now, in terms of that review, the, the Magnitsky sanctions, are there other people that should be added to those lists? Is there is there more that should be done using that tool? We know that, that SEMA is being used. Is there more that should be done using the Magnitsky tools? Well, certainly, uh, there are uh, several thousand political prisoners in Russia today since the war began. Uh, in the first few months of the war, um, thousands of Russians took to the streets to protest this war. Um, they were all brutally arrested. Um, the entire Russian opposition, uh, the ones that remained in Russia, that includes Vladimir Karamurza, Ilya Yashin and others, uh, they've all been detained. They are likely going to be in prison, as you mentioned, for 10 years, possibly more. Um, we should be looking at those individuals, those Russian officials who ordered their arrests, those who arrested them from from in the Kremlin, all the way down to those officials who uh, were involved in taking them uh, to the, uh, to in, putting them into jail, we should be looking at all those individuals and placing sanctions on them. So yes, there's a lot more that we can do with our Magnitsky legislation, which of course targets specific human rights uh, abusers in regimes like those in. Uh, Mr. Kolga, you mentioned the ability of committees to be able to nominate people for sanctions. I do just want to note for your information, for the record, that Bill C-281, uh, tabled by my colleague Philip Lawrence, the International Human Rights Act, does contain some of those provisions, and we will be debating that bill in Parliament this fall, and hopefully it will be uh, coming to us here at this committee soon. Um, it's been reported recently as well by CBC that, uh, that the value of frozen sanctions in Canada has dropped in recent months. Um, to suggest the possibility that some people have been allowed to sell off assets. Uh, do you have any reflections or, or information about how it is that the value of frozen assets uh, under sanction would, uh, would somehow be, uh, be dropping? Uh, well, that's a very good question. I, I saw that uh, that same report. Um, according to that report, uh, uh, by August um, 9th, initially, the RCMP had reported that $289 million worth of Russian assets had been uh, had been frozen, and then they revised that number to $122.3 million. I'm not I'm not sure how. Um, what would account for that sort of a drop? It could be that the um, the shares and stocks. Certainly, there's there's one uh, one rather large steel company that is owned by a prominent Putin-linked oligarch, um, which has uh, found itself in quite a bit of hot hot water uh, since the war started. It's entirely possible that the value of that company, because of the sanctions, because of the war, has dropped. And it could be that uh, uh, other assets uh, may have uh, have have fallen in value because of that war as well. So it could be okay. because of that. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure how to account for that. Okay. Something that maybe we, the, the committee should seek further information on. Uh, this question is for, for all the witnesses and, and people can go in whatever order. Um, the Canadian press reported recently that the government of Canada uh, was considering the quote, domestic economy, jobs and inflation uh, in making their decision on granting the sanctions waiver. Uh, the fact that they were considering domestic economic factors was a big surprise given that it was discordant with the explanations previously given. We know that the government was lobbied recently by Siemens, though we don't know on which subjects. Um, and it seems that the minister uh, has waived sanctions on, on Russia, uh, rejecting concerns raised by U Ukraine, um, uh, in part to protect the interests of a large company uh, which operates uh, fairly close to her riding. I wonder what kind of precedent is set when the government is saying that they are granting an exemption like this, not because of, of geopolitical factors, but because of domestic economic factors. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, question, Chair. Um, philosophers call that a moral hazard. That is, 
it creates conditions under which your actions with a, a narrow uh, definition of interest uh, further down led to unintended consequences that actually harm uh, both the um, your your own interests, but as well as as others. And like I said in my uh, in my in my initial opening remarks, um, once you start carving out exemptions uh, for for domestic political uh, reasons, um, everyone else start asking the same, and therefore you actually create a Swiss cheese uh, of, of of sanctions, and everyone uh, start you know chopping from uh, one part to another, and thus you know it undermines the sanctions. Sanctions work in the long term when they are uh, united and they are consistently applied and you're not going to be you know, accused of hypocrisy uh, when you're asking other countries, say, uh, in the global south um, to uh, sanction or to join the uh, sanctions against Russia, but at the same time providing uh, you know, uh, carve-outs for, uh, for your domestic uh, political or economic uh, interests. So it significantly undermines uh, credibility as well as the sanctions regime. Start off with uh, Dr. Schmidt. Um, in terms of uh, weaponizing energy, you mentioned that Russia has been uh, doing that for years, uh, well before this current conflict in Ukraine. Um, could you share uh, what other conflicts has Russia done this in? Um, was it done uh, during the wars in Chechnya from 1994 to 96, 99 to 2000, or sorry, I should say 2009, uh, in Georgia in 2008, or the war in uh, the Donbass in 2017, Syria 2015? If you can comment on that, please. Thanks so much. That's, a, that's an excellent question. The bottom line is um, Russia has been weaponizing energy for many years, and this has a wide definition. First of all, there are the overt gas cuts that we can see that have happened dozens of times over the years. Um, I, I can supply the committee with a list of, of everyone that I am aware of, uh, but I know it's uh, at least 20 or 30 long, uh, these sort of um, these sort of instances. And, you know, this this doesn't necessarily mirror military conflicts that the Russian Federation have been in, because the Russian Federation under Vladimir Putin has been in a hybrid war at the same time uh, during all of, you know, many of the conflicts that you mentioned, at least since uh, at least the mid-2000s through now, um, with the West, and has been using energy in one way or another to either create market uncertainty and energy insecurity by actual energy cuts, or doing what I'm really concerned about as well, which is using energy as a, a means of strategic corruption, meaning to uh, enact you know energy deals and things like this, and then allow for elite capture around this. And we saw this in 2005 to 2006, when former German Chancellor Gerhard Schroeder stepped out of office and was, uh, after being in office at the, the end of his tenure, um, supporting Nord Stream 1 and, and basically pushing that project forward, stepped out and was chairman of Nord Stream AG. Uh, we saw this go on with Nord Stream 2, things around Nord Stream 2, former Austrian um, Econ Minister uh, Hans Jörg Schelling became uh, Nord Stream 2's uh, Nord Stream 2 AG's uh, senior advisor after stepping out of office. Former Austrian Foreign Minister Karen Kneisel stepped out of office. Uh, of course, she was famously uh, um, covered with um, uh, in in the press with uh, having Putin at her wedding and dancing with Putin at her wedding. Stepped out of office after supporting Nord Stream 2 and others, uh, you know, pro Russian. Uh, policies while in office and was appointed uh, um, board member of Russian state-owned oil company Rosneft. Uh, former French Prime Minister Francois Fillon was uh, nominated to not one but two uh, Russian uh, state-owned oil and gas trading companies. So this really is a concern and this is what, what I'm constantly calling uh, for in the United States which is to start this norm-setting process. The United States should pass an act called the, the Stop Helping America's Malign Enemies, or SHAME Act. When small case shame doesn't work, you need large case shame. And it, it doesn't have to be called that here in Canada, but Canada can join in this effort. Um, there should be a Magnitsky-level anti-elite capture and anti-strategic corruption effort legislatively throughout global democracies to make sure that former officials cannot leave the public trust and then work for authoritarian state-owned enterprises. It shouldn't be controversial. This is something that this parliament can do today if it'd like to. At least put out a statement saying that it's the sense of parliament that, that this sort of practice can no longer happen because it's still legal in too many jurisdictions. First off, the German ambassador, when she appeared before this committee, said that from our point of view, 
we would have lost significantly in the disinformation war if that turbine had not been able to be delivered. My question, Mr. Koga, in your view, how could we have lost this war of disinformation or misinformation if it hadn't been delivered? Uh, well, that information war would have simply continued, and, and now that we have returned that that turbine, we see it continue. Um, the the Russian government has continuously made excuses to stop, uh, to reduce the flow of, of gas through uh, Nord Stream One, and now that it's stopped uh, that flow completely, um, it is continuously blamed uh, various different types of paperwork, um, uh, insufficient repairs, and it is continuing to uh, blame Canadian sanctions, not just for again, it's a uh, it's energy warfare right now, but even uh, the uh, the food uh, crisis that it is causing, it is continuing to to blame us. So uh, you know, I, I'm not sure that um, that maintaining those sanctions would have made the uh, the information warfare any any more intense, or it, whether it's reduced it. I, I think that uh, Vladimir Putin will continue using disinformation to spread lies, to create conspiracies in, in order to uh, undermine our geopolitical position, but also use these same uh, issues, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, uh, to try and destabilize and polarize uh, Canadian society and, and uh, societies in other, uh, in other Western democracies. We note that the sanctions are having negative effects on the economies of the countries that have chosen to put them in. So there is a bit of reaction that's happening. Some people are even hostile to the sanctions. Some politicians in Europe, specifically in France, are denouncing the sanctions and stating that they're not effective and that Russia has never enriched itself as much on gas uh, as it has to, to support its war effort in Ukraine. Mr. Peskov's statement sta saying that they were going to cut off uh, the supply, isn't that sort of countering those other statements and showing that the sanctions are having an effect on Russia's economy? Well, yes, uh, I think it demonstrates that Vladimir Putin is very much in a bit of a panic mode about uh, about the sanctions. Uh, Dr. Schmidt mentioned earlier that uh, Russia is no longer able to repair any of its uh, military equipment, that it's using parts from household appliances to patch up uh, various different uh, weapons. Uh, there have been reports that Aer Aeroflot is cannibalizing its own aircrafts for parts in order to carry out uh, repairs. Uh, a majority of Russians polled recently said that they are deeply concerned about the effect of, of sanctions. And uh, a recently leaked Russian cabinet document report suggests that um, there is deep concern about brain drain caused by the sanctions. Um, by 2025, it's estimated by the Russian government itself that, that 200,000 IT professionals are going to leave Russia and that there will be an 8 to 11 percent contraction of the Russian economy within the next 24 months and that it'll take a decade for Russia to recover its economy to pre-war levels. So, um, Sanctions are working. Um, you know, sanctions aren't a silver bullet. They take time to work. It's like medicine, and they need to be sustained. Um, you know, carving out exceptions for various different Russian entities doesn't work. Um, we need to sustain them in order for them to work. And I think Vladimir Putin, with his reaction, Dmitry Peskov's reaction, demonstrate exactly that, that Western sanctions, when unified, are indeed. Um, all of our, our witnesses today spoke, I believe, about the, the weaponization of energy, but, but also we have some deep concerns, of course, about the weaponization of food, um, the impacts that that will have around the world, the weaponization of, of climate, the weaponization of, of nuclear power. Um, you know, we are, I am somebody who's very deeply afraid of what we're seeing happening in the nuclear plant in, in Ukraine, um, deeply concerned what we're hearing from the UN observers that are there. And I'm wondering if I could just very quickly ask all three of our witnesses, perhaps Mr. Colga, I'll start with you, on what Canada can be doing more to help with, with regards to the grain weaponization and with regards to, you know, other aspects like the weaponization of, of, of nuclear. 
Well, thank you for that uh, very important question. Um, you may not like this answer, but I think that we need to send more weapons uh, to the Ukrainians, certainly harpoon missiles, um, to deter Russian attacks on vessels leaving Odessa with that grain, the grain that is so desperately needed in so many parts of, of North Africa uh, and Asia. Uh, Vladimir Putin stated very clearly again this morning that um, that Ukraine is somehow reneging on its deal uh, to export that grain, that the Western, Western sanctions are preventing grain from being exported. This is nonsense. Uh, Ukrainian grain, gr those shipments are being made from Odessa, and we need to simply assume, quite frankly, that Vladimir Putin will renege on that deal. Um, he may uh, consider attacking some of those ships or causing some sort of problems. He's already attacked uh, agricultural infrastructure in Odessa after signing that agreement. Um, so that's that's one concern. As far as the nuclear blackmail is concerned, that he may be very well engaging in very soon, um, I think that we need to insist that those um, uh, International Atomic Agency uh, officials remain in Zaporizhia, that uh, those numbers are, are increased to keep an eye on what's going on there and to demand that they have access to areas of that plant where uh, Russia has placed its its weapon systems. So that's that's a, that's another thing that Canada could be doing immediately. Thank you, Mr. Kolko. Would either of our guests from the chamber also be interested in answering that? Um, thank you very much for this question. I think one of the other things that Canada can do and should do as a, as a full superpower is to make sure that Canadian agricultural products uh, get to the world markets. Uh, maybe, you know, given the distances and so on and so forth, it may not necessarily directly go to uh, one of the most effective regions, but it can easily replace other grain that can actually go then um, to countries in North Africa, uh, in the Middle East and Asia and elsewhere. And we need to be able to provide our, our farmers uh, uh, the, with the ability and the resources to rapidly and radically increase uh, food production and, and getting those uh, products to the world markets when we are clearly uh, facing and will face uh, food, food shortages. Thank you, Mr. Schmidt. I would say that Canada should continue to uh, lead the charge on um, increasing sanctions. I will come back to energy and say that other areas that need to increase are um, you know, ship to ship transfer technology sanctions. Uh, there is a, a significant amount of, of oil transfer that's going on uh, several hundred miles off the coast of Portugal. Um, that that needs to to end, you know, basically uh, through uh, technology sanctions and on firms and insurers that are allowing for that to happen. And of course, coming back to what we're here about today, reversing the the turbine waiver decision. Right, I have uh, you know pages of of examples of of officials of experts um, of Siemens itself pointing out that there is no technical. Uh, rationale. There wasn't before the decision was made. There certainly isn't now. Um, and, and I'll be submitting that to this uh, this parliamentary committee for the record. Um, so this shows exactly that we need to have a technology guided approach for our foreign policy decision making. And that's why this decision needs to be um, needs to be reversed as quickly as possible. Comment on what you know the the algorithms they must be using in order to maximize their own funds flow here. Well, I mean, I, I think that we have to look back at the broader sanctions regime on both oil and gas. Um, you know, when you look at gas in particular, one of the arguments are, well, you know, just like oil, they could just sell this elsewhere, right? Well, no, the, the, you know, oil, gas is not fungible um, in the way globally, at least not yet. Um, there is LNG that increases its fungibility, but it's not as fungible as oil. And so that's why what uh, Mr. Kolga said is so important. This, again, another technical driver here that's showing proof of what's going on at Porto Vaya, which is uh, gas flaring, where there's significant amount of the resource that Russia would be sending through Nord Stream 1 that is instead just going up uh, and um, you know being burned and creating uh, all sorts of problems, not only for the localized environment, but for for uh, you know, for uh, the climate, especially in the Arctic region, um, where you know, increasing uh, the amount of soot that's going on to the Arctic tundra is changing the albedo of the of of the uh, the surface of the the Arctic region. That is um, only increasing uh, the okay. rate of climate change. Uh, yeah, region. exactly. Yeah. If I can interrupt there, Mr. Yeah. Schmidt, exactly the case, and you know, the the issue, of course, being 
that uh, Canada at the same point in time not supplying its energy to the world because we've been constrained in, in production. Two weeks ago, we we're actually getting negative numbers for our natural gas, in, you know, in, in North America. Dr. Schmidt, relating to what you were saying earlier, you mentioned the importance of unity as uh, allies in the way we respond to Russia. To my mind, that's absolutely fundamental. I'd like to hear what you have to say, given the recent developments, specifically in Italy, for instance, um, politically, or also discussions that uh, took place earlier this summer in Germany. Can you tell us a bit more about the importance of maintaining this unity that, of course, Putin is trying to undo at all costs. He's trying to divide uh, NATO, the G7, the European Union. Can you tell us about how important it is uh, to maintain allied unity? Of course, feel comfortable answering in English. Uh, merci, uh, Madame Bendien. Um But that's all I'll do there. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I, I think that your question is absolutely spot on, and, and it's incredibly important that we maintain unity. Obviously, as I said earlier, um, the success that Ukraine will have uh, to uh, win the war and restore full territorial integrity and sovereignty over its territory um, is paramount that uh, that global democracies stand united against Russian um, aggression, both in Ukraine, but also hybrid warfare, whether it's cyber attacks, whether it's disinformation, whether it's propaganda, whether it's energy weaponization, whether it's using uh, you know space assets uh, in ways that are um, that are concerning to global security. So w what we have to do is make sure that sanctions are are staying united and that, you know, when we have these sort of situations where over the years Russia has basically built energy infrastructure and used it to split allies, we have to look at where was the unity on projects like Nord Stream 2. Over the years, all of NATO's eastern flank at one point or another opposed and called for this project to be stopped. The United States, both Democrats and Republicans, both administrations and um, uh, and on Capitol Hill, called for this project to be stopped. I visited, when I was in my role as European Energy Security uh, Advisor at State, I visited Ottawa in 2018, and Global Affairs Canada uh, also had come out opposed to Nord Stream 2. The United Kingdom, France at times, has uh, opposed Nord Stream 2, as had uh, a number of uh, countries um, throughout the, the Nordic uh, region. Uh, basically, the only countries that supported Nord Stream 2 were Germany, Austria, um, and, and of course, Russia. And so, again, when you have uh, examples where uh, the European Parliament, for example, on a nearly unanimous basis, uh, basis or at least uh, extreme majorities, uh, on at least three occasions called for this project to be stopped over the years, for that to continue to go forward and for Germany to pressure the United States to suspend its sanctions and then for Germany to then pressure Canada to suspend its sanctions, of course, a slightly different situation, but in this case on the Nord Stream 1 turbines. You know, those are the sort of actions that we need to avoid as global democracies. We need to continue to mount pressure as much as possible on the Putin regime so that democratic norms will be restored uh, and sovereignty will be restored in Ukraine and so that we'll become more resilient going forward uh, to stand up to authoritarian aggression, whether it comes from Russia, China, or elsewhere. Merci. I have only I have only a few seconds left, Dr. Schmidt, but it's been reported that Russia um, acquired attack drones from Iran and that now it's looking to buy artillery ammunition from North Korea. I wonder if you could just comment briefly with the time that we have left on on, on what this might suggest. Is Russia running out of um, ammunition? Yeah, this this suggests that the technology calibrated sanctions that have been put in place against uh, dual use technologies are working. That Russia is having to look to other authoritarian nations, Tehran and Pyongyang, uh, among others, to backfill its uh, military equipment. And so this is again why we need to continue to have this united approach to maintain not not have more and more waivers uh, for sanctions, but maintain sanctions pressure and increasing sanctions on a daily daily, if not, you know, weekly, if not daily basis. Um, th this has to continue uh, in order to make sure Ukraine succeeds. Yeah, 
Does it suggest to you that sanctions are working? Yes, it absolutely does. 